Today we are looking at poetry of the Romantic era. It's my opinion that the invention of written language is the most important thing that has ever been done in the history of the world. And that's true. That's truly what I believe. There's nothing else that has been more important in the history of the earth than the ability to write things down and share ideas through a written form of language. What writing has allowed us to do, and what writing technically is, is it allows us to live symbolically. Writing itself is a collection of little teeny tiny symbols, right? And when you put all those little teeny tiny symbols together, they make words. And when you put those words, which are symbols themselves, together, you can start creating ideas and you can share those ideas. The things we write don't have any intrinsic value to them. The little shapes you make don't actually mean anything. But when we invented a way to have them symbolically represent something else, suddenly the whole world opens up to us. We can say anything that possibly could come into our mind and even things we haven't thought of yet. We can invent new ways of communicating them. So we live symbolically. We share ideas across continents, across centuries, because we have the ability to take a marking and have it represent something else. And we live these symbols every day. Our whole lives are dripping with symbolism. We just don't realize it. We don't pay attention to it. Everything we do is wrapped up in symbols. It's getting to the end of the semester. All of us are, well, some of us maybe, are getting a little panicky about grades. What do you think grades are? It's just a symbol. They don't actually mean anything. All right. For 97% of you, depending on what field you go into, no one's going to care. They won't. No one will care. It's not a symbol. It's not a, 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 a defining quality of you as a person. It's just a letter. It doesn't really mean anything on its own. That's why I always encourage my freshman classes that don't worry about your grades. Your job at college is to experience and meet and learn as much as you possibly can. It's not about assigning a letter to it, because that is actually who you are as a person, is all the things you've done and all the things you've learned. That's what really matters. And so you're going to panic about these grades over the next couple weeks as we prepare for finals. And then in a couple more weeks, we have a graduation where, guess what? You're, you're aiming to get another symbol. You're going to walk across the stage and get a piece of paper. It's just a piece of paper. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it doesn't define who you are. You and your experiences are who you actually are. It's just a piece of paper. You, you might lose it over the course of your life. It might get lost in a box somewhere. It doesn't matter. It's just a piece of paper. And we hold on to that paper dearly so that we can someday get a job where we can go get more pieces of paper. It's just more symbols, okay? Our whole lives are revolved around symbols. You guys play sports. You ladies play sports. Why? To win a plastic trophy? It's just a symbol, right? Yet we care about it really deeply. You know an Olympic gold medal? The value of the actual gold medal is only worth like $550. That's it. People devote their entire athletic lives to pursuing this thing that's worth, comparatively, almost nothing. Why do, we, why do we pursue those things so much? Why do you guys chase trophies and awards so much? Well, it's because they're symbolic. They do have meaning in them. So we have meaning, or we have, we have meaning symbolized everywhere. I see one right here. Raise your hand if you have either a piece of jewelry or a tattoo that has a cross on it. Oh, look at all the symbols, right? Symbols everywhere. Why do we stand, why do we stand and sing at a piece of cloth in the gym? It's just a symbol. It's just a symbol, right? But we give it a lot of meaning. Why do people panic when there's fascists who throw Bibles into bonfires? It's just paper, right? but we imbue it with this meaning that those words in here matter. 
that the ideas matter and they, they last over long periods of time. So when we talk about poetry and students get panicky that, oh my gosh, my teacher's going to talk about poetry, how boring and it's too hard and I don't understand it. You're living lives of poetry every day. You just don't know it. It's all around you. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to see if we can heighten our senses a little bit to pay a little closer attention to see what symbols these authors had to give us and maybe they can point us towards you know, how we might improve our lives in, in some way. We need to read poetry because we need to participate. The medium that something is presented in affects the meaning that it has in it. And art is the best example of that. You have to listen to Mozart to actually appreciate it or to even have a glimpse, a piece of understanding what he's trying to accomplish when he composes a symphony or an opera. You have to actually listen to it. Professor Kent, as smart as she is, and as well as she explained those pieces to us and what the, the structure of those pieces were, she had to play them for us because it doesn't matter how well you explain it. We have to hear it. You have to look at a Monet painting to actually understand what he's trying to accomplish or a Picasso painting. I can't just explain those things to you and have you go, oh yeah, that's what a Monet painting is. No, you have to actually see it. The same is true with poetry. You have to actually read it or any form of created literature. You can't just have someone go, this is what it was about. It doesn't work. It does work with other things like history. We can, we can tell you when things happened. We can, we can break down philosophical ideas for you. There are fields where it is okay to just explain stuff. That's fine. But for things that are created, like art, you have to actually participate in it. So when I, <laughs> when I or other teachers ask you to read things, it's kind of for a reason. You have to actually do it to, in order to get the full meaning out of it. I can't, as well as I'm going to try to explain all this stuff to you today, it can never do it justice to you actually reading it yourself. So I encourage you, if you haven't yet, make sure you look at the poems that I've posted. I'm actually going to post a couple more by Thursday to get us prepared for our discussion. You have to actually read them because explaining them doesn't do it justice. All right. So to get us started with actually reading poetry, we're going to start with a poem and then we're going to get to our, uh, our two key authors for the day who, who really define what this period is, is all about. All right. So we're going to look at a piece from uh, Emily Dickinson that's super short to get us started. As Professor Harris talked about during his art presentation, when we say the Romantic era, we're not specifically pointing to a, 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 a concrete time frame. Anything that has anything based on ideas doesn't just pop up in one, one day or one year and then stop in one year. There's always a, a movement across time. So even though I have on here the dates of 1800 to 1850, add a decade or two on each side of that because ideas are never just in one place. They always change, right? So um, these dates aren't exactly hard and fast dates. So we're going to look at a piece that's a couple years outside that boundary, but I would still consider Emily Dickinson a romantic poet. So we're going to look at this line by line. It's super short, but maybe it'll give us a glimpse into what at least her version of poetry might be, and we'll see if it aligns with what some of our other authors today believe about poetry. So let's take a look. First line. We're going we're gonna to look at this very closely. Justin, when you read that first line, what do you see? What do you think that first line might mean? What does the best way mean? Help who, the reader or the author? Who, who are we talking about? OK. 
Okay. Okay. Right here. What do you think it means when you tell something at slant? Not all of it. Not all of it. Why would we want to tell the truth but not all of it? What do you mean? Okay, be sensitive. What else? Slant. Who has an idea? What does slant mean in this line? Take a stab at it. There's no wrong answer. What do you think? Uh, well, I think there might be a wrong answer. But <laughs> <laughs> there are wrong answers, but I'm open. Uh, Go ahead. Okay, good. So maybe it's intended to maximize our information. Maybe it's intended to cover up some things, even though we're going to be truthful. Maybe it's a way of doing it not directly, not head on, but sort of at an angle. I'm going to, I'm going to bend it slightly for you to see if that helps you understand better. Let's see if those three hypotheses follow through. Success in circuit lies. What do you think? Red sweatshirt. What's your name? Yeah. Lauren. Lauren. What do you think that next line means? Good. Okay. So what does circuit mean here, you think? Okay, very good. What else? Unity? Okay. Good. Now, Dickinson capitalizes that C in circuit. You might think, ooh, maybe she's trying to emphasize that a little bit. Maybe. She also capitalizes all sorts of weird words, so it's hard to tell. So this word circuit is kind of a weird word. Circuit does mean bringing things together. If it goes all the way and comes around, circuit does mean could mean circle, but it means a way around, right? If, if you take a circuitous route to a destination, you kind of take the long way. You go around a bit. You don't go directly to it. So this circuit idea is fitting with our slant idea that it's not direct. It's not straight on. It's not blasting the truth right in your face. It's maybe we're going we're gonna to just dance around it slightly. Notice the word lies. Kind of an odd word here because lies means, can mean two different things. What are the two ways we can define the word lies? Lying down. Lying down. Okay, so this is where it is. This is where the success exists. This is where it were to lie down, if it were. And also, it's not truthful. So could it be that truth, when it's presented properly, might also, in a way, be not maybe fully lying, but at least somewhat deceptive? Perhaps. Or it could just be where it is, that it's found in the way around, not straight through. Let's see if she keeps going with that. Too bright for our infirm delight. <laughs> it does rhyme. Bridget, what do you think, Bridget? Too good. What is? The truth? Yeah. Okay. How can truth be too bright? Don't we want truth to be bright and illuminating and helpful? We can't handle the truth. <laughs> all right. Jack, all right. How about the word infirm? Want to know the quick definition of infirm? Could be diseased means weakness usually. It could mean unstable. It has a couple different meanings actually. So success in circuit lies too bright for our infirm delight. I think we're on the right track. I think maybe if we are too truthful, if we're just too blatant and honest and just giving facts to people, we won't really be able to understand it enough. We've got to present it in a way that seems like it's not being accurate enough, but ultimately we hope it will be. Let's see if she proves that for us. The truth's superb surprise as lightning to the children eased. 
Mario in the black hat. What do you think? That's you, man. What's your name? Caden. As lightning to the children eased. What do you think about that line? When you were a kid and you heard or saw lightning and heard thunder, what did you think about it? Get inside. It's a little scary. Did your parents ever tell you anything about it? No, never? Wow. All right. Helpful. <laughs> Helpful parents. All right. Anyone, anyone have their parents tell you something about lightning and thunder? What? So, someone tell me. Okay. That's what? God's bowling, okay. <laughs> that would be a superb surprise if that were, if that were happening. When I was a kid, my dad would tell me, because I, like, I, I didn't like loud noises when I was a kid. I didn't like fireworks. I didn't like thunder. I just didn't like loud things. I've gotten better with it. But <laughs> when I was a kid, I would get real scared at night if, the, if there was thunder and lightning. And so my dad would say, well, just when you see the flash, listen for the thunder and that's about how far away it is. And, and then, you know, it's not, it's not happening right over the house. It's, it's miles away. It's nothing to be scared of. There's, you know, you don't have to worry about it until you can start counting and you hear that it gets closer and then you get a little more scared. <laughs> so I have no idea if that's factually true or not. Probably not. I don't know. But it's helpful. It helps. It's probably not true, but it does, it did ease my mind as a kid to know that, oh, the lightning isn't dangerous as long as you're inside. And in fact, it could be really far away. There's nothing immediately to worry about. With explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually. So as we said, maybe we shouldn't tell you exactly what's going on all the time. Maybe if we present it in a way that's a little circuitous, a little easier to handle, it might actually be more helpful for us. Or else every man be blind. Maybe we can't handle the some truths. They're too big and too powerful. If we tried to actually understand it, we wouldn't, we wouldn't get it, or it would be too scary. If my dad would have sat me down as a six-year-old and told me what lightning actually is, it probably would have freaked me out. It comforted me instead to have him tell me this thing about lightning that was maybe not completely truthful, but I understood it enough to be able to not be so scared. So, there are truths in this world that are incredibly powerful. In fact, they're so powerful, maybe we can't even clearly understand them sometimes. But maybe poetry, or the job of a poet, is to present those truths in a way that might seem like we're taking the long way around, where you think, oh my gosh, why are you being so descriptive? Why don't you just tell me what it is? Maybe the poet might be thinking, yeah, I can't just tell you what it is. You wouldn't get it. I need to present it in a way that you'll actually appreciate it. Maybe that's what Ms. Dickinson is trying to do here. And we'll see if it aligns with what our poets who started this movement called Romanticism were trying to do as well. So, when we think about poetry, we might think, well, what exactly is it? We got Emily Dickinson's way of how she might think about poetry, but when we hear poetry in a historical context, we got to think that it meant everything at one point, pretty much everything, right? It wasn't uh, what we think of now where, oh, poems are just these short little things that are constructed in a very specific way, and that's only called poetry. Poetry, from the beginning of, of writing, included almost everything. So it was just not rhetoric. So rhetoric would be, you know, the arguments you're presenting as, as uh, topics to be discussed. All right? So these are kind of real world. These are things people make speeches on. These are things you write your essays on. It's, it's rhetoric. You're making a point of some kind that hopefully is truthful. Poetry was everything that was included that was creative, that meant something else or displayed uh, fictitious actions or was written in a creative way. So it included short poetry, but it also included drama. It included what we might think of as narratives. They were all lumped into poetry. So the beginning of poetry was a very broad idea, and it kind of got whittled down over time to what uh, distinguishes it from other forms of writing. Here's what a couple other famous authors had to say. Samuel Coleridge, who is during our time period here and very influential, I just didn't have 
time or space to fit him in today. He said, poetry has given me the habit of wishing to discover the good and beautiful in all that meets and surrounds me. Poetry are the best words in the best order. That's a theme that will definitely come back the rest of our hour together. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe, another person from this time period. The poetry of words is the rhythmical creation of beauty. So there's something inherently beautiful about putting these words together in a certain way that hopefully brings about truth and an appreciation of things that are, that are beautiful. Even Socrates was thought to have said, I decided that it was not wisdom that enabled poets to write their poetry, but a kind of instinct or inspiration, such as you would find in seers and prophets who deliver their sublime messages without knowing in the least what they mean. I think maybe he's being a little tongue-in-cheek there, but I also think that's probably pretty true. Though the authors we're going to talk about today, to a certain degree, did have a plan in what they were doing, they were also operating out of instinct and excitement and maybe not always knowing where they were going to end up. And what we do know, research actually shows this, that that's actually what creative people do. Not just artists, but even inventors and entrepreneurs. They actually see the world in a way that may not always be fully formed, but they have ideas that are almost prophetic in nature. They can see things beyond what normally exists. That's why we have certain people who are, who are geniuses that come up with new and interesting things all the time. They see things differently. They can look ahead and anticipate things to come. That's what our poets here today are going to try to do as well. So those are a few basic ideas of what poetry might be. I had you look at two key authors for our class today that really aimed to define what this time period was all about. We have to keep in mind that whenever a new artistic or even philosophical movement begins, it's usually one of two things, right? And we've discussed this before. It's a, either a, a sort of rebellion against or an elaboration on something that came before it. Either the people of the time said, you know what, the way we were doing things and the way we thought about things was not very effective, didn't work, in fact, there's better ways, we're going to do something different now. Or they said, well, it was, you know, what we did before kind of worked, but it wasn't fully thought out yet, we need to improve upon it and, and really clarify what it meant, and we're going to do it better now. So that's what Romanticism was. It's a reaction to which time period did we just come out of. What time period did we just come out of? Oh, goodness. When you start the semester over, Dr. Bryson. The Enlightenment. The Enlightenment, right? So the Enlightenment is a time period of science and reason, right? That the world can be understood using just our minds. The Romantics came along and thought, wait a second. Maybe there's more to it than that. Maybe that's not the only way to be looking at life. And in fact, maybe we should think about the other parts of our minds and ourselves that go beyond or that are different from uh, just our reasoning and that, that uh, only want to look at things empirically. Our gentlemen here today are going to present something very different than that. So in our really generalized time frame of what we're talking about here, we've got you know, the classical era, that's where you started this semester or started uh, your humanities sequence. We then move towards the uh, Renaissance, cover the Enlightenment, and now we're moving towards the Romantic era. So, in Wordsworth's preface to lyrical ballads, what is he trying to accomplish? Well, I think there's really broadly three things to, to get from the start. One, he's breaking from that tradition. And that tradition, when it came to poetry, sort of had a hierarchy, that there were things that were considered really good poetry, and they worked them, their, their way down to things that were eh, not taken as seriously, let's say. So we started with epic. This is, you know, Paradise Lost kind of stuff. This is, these are the big ideas. All the way down to lyric poetry. These are the, the small couplets, uh, simple rhymes, often very playful, not always taken as seriously as something like Milton's work, all right? So there's this hierarchy, and what Wordsworth 
is intending to do here is to say, I don't think we should be put in these categories anymore. That while there are values uh, that each of those forms has, or that they, that they all have, poetry can be beyond that. Poetry doesn't have to be categorized like that. Anything can be poetry if it's done well. So breaking down the traditional poetic hierarchies, removing you know, the, uh, moving past the uh, Enlightenment era and all the other eras that came before it, all the way back to classical poetry. Purpose number one. Number two, to maintain, in capital letters, humanity. The beginning or the end of the 18th century and into the 19th century, we know that the Industrial Revolution is in full swing. And guys like Wordsworth in Britain are seeing changes in society, and he's not exactly thrilled with it. See if this rings a bell. <laughs> he's seeing increases in technology and machinery. He's seeing people moving away from the rural parts of the country into cities. He's seeing smokestacks and pollution everywhere. He's seeing people get enamored with consumerism. And he thinks, I, I don't like that. We're losing our humanity. We're not people anymore. We're just becoming these machines who go to work for 14 hours a day and get dirty and just so we can buy stuff. And he is going to present for us a way to regain some of our humanity. So I think that probably rings some bells for us. We'll come back to that here in a minute. And lastly, he wants poetry to be more inclusive. Poetry and any of the other fine arts had always been only for elites for the most part. Right? Only the people who could afford to have an education could even read and understand those older works of literature. And so therefore there was an automatic divide between, between classes, between people. Wordsworth comes along and he says, you know, we all should be able to access poetry. It should be good for everybody. We should all be able to enjoy this beautiful thing. It's not for just special people. It's not ju for just powerful people or rich people or educated people. We should write in a way that pretty much anyone can understand it so that we can all enjoy it. So these are three fundamental goals, I think, that uh, Wordsworth presents for us in his preface to his very big poetic book, Lyrical Ballads. So what does he talk about? Or what does he think poetry should talk about? Well, he believes that poems should be rooted in common life. That, again, regular people should be able to understand the, the topics and the themes that we present to them. They shouldn't only be for, um, again, aristocratic people who are living a completely different life than, than regular folks. He believes that common life is the foundation of what these poems should be about. So it's the things people see every day in the streets, the things people go through every day on their farms or at their jobs or what they see in their surroundings, regular stuff. But, he has a lot of buts in his, his ideas here, but these topics are going to be able to spark imagination. So it's based in the real world, but he also wants us to be imaginative. So this is going to start to echo some of that idea of presenting things in a slant. It's going to look slightly different. But that's the goal, is to present things that are rooted in common life. Well, how's he going to do it? By using common language. As I said, he's going to move away from the really ornate, fancy language of the past and try to make it a bit simpler for regular people. So we talked about uh, when I uh, introduced Dickens and set the basis of this time period, how uh, his famous line from his preface is the spontaneous overflow of emotion. So he believes that people's actual emotions, that when you have a real feeling about something and you just can't wait to put it on the page because you're so excited about it, that's where truth lies. That's what's true. And so he wants to, he wants to present poems that, that sound like that. But, at the same time, it's not like he's just writing in a haphazard way. He does acknowledge that, well, when I write, I do have deep thoughts. I do sit and contemplate things for a while. I don't just scribble things down at the, at the last minute. 
So it's a bit of both. He wants to be excited and have emotion and have it pour out of him because that's what he feels is, is valuable. But at the same time, he's, he is going to carefully construct and choose his words carefully um, so that it creates the best poem. He also doesn't want it to be completely sloppy. But he believes that these reactions, these emotional responses, are more real than other forms of poetry. He will also have, uh, as he says, no personification of abstract ideas. Sorry, I lost my page where his quote was. Let me find it real fast. Oh, I lost it. Anyway, like I said, he doesn't want poetry to be beyond the accessibility of regular people. So he's not going to rely on those old tricks of using personification and really super fancy figurative language. He believes that poetic diction actually gets in the way of revealing the truth. So he's going to try to be as straightforward as he possibly can. And in fact, it's going to be so straightforward sometimes that it might even look like prose, which is normal, normal writing, right? Um, it won't be written in structured lines with structured uh, syllables, and things won't always rhyme. Uh, there, it's going to look like you could just read it straight through like you would a paragraph. And in fact, as he says later in his piece, Poetry and prose are actually much closer to each other than people originally thought. People uh, treated them very differently. He says, no, we're going we're to treat them almost exactly the same. So you, it's easier to read. It's not as much fancy language. And in fact, it sounds pretty much like prose writing, which is what we're all used to anyway. So what else? Oh, too far. All right, so how do we accomplish all this? One, he says... Got to be exciting. Romantic poetry can't be boring. Right? You, can't, you can't just uh, explain stuff. It has to have an emotional quality to it that not only displays the emotion of the author, but brings about the emotion of the reader. It has to be exciting, and you have to be able to feel it when you read the work. Again, this is why you have to actually read it. I can't just tell you about it. He wants you to participate in this exchange of feelings. The way that these feelings come about, he says, are through the poet's style, that you can't just present a topic and expect the reader to go, oh, I have feelings about that topic. He says you can present mostly any topic, but if it's written the right way, it will bring the feelings up in you or out of you. And that's what good writing does, which I really, really like. I was actually... Um, Vis, uh, watching uh, the movie Creed, Creed 2 over the, the weekend. And uh, I feel the, the same thing. I, I came home and I told my wife, I was like, you know, she's like, oh, how was it? And I was like, ah, it's really average. And uh, the reason why is this very reason. The subject matter is great. In fact, the subject matter is deeper. It has more complexity and, and scope, really, than the original Rocky movies do. Yet the original Rocky movies are so much better made. They're so much better made than these new Creed movies are. That when I watch these Creed movies, I think, it's a good topic. I get what they're doing. It's, it's, it's fine. But I don't have any emotional reaction to it. Whereas the previous films, actually the storyline is much simpler. But because of the way it's told, tremendously emotional films. So think about that when you read certain books or or watch certain movies or anything like that. Is the author just presenting you a topic that expects you to just automatically have an emotional reaction to it? Or is the author presenting it in a way, by using their style and technique, that actually elevates the topic beyond what it would have been on its own? Because that's what a good romantic writer does. Ultimately, we want to regain our humanness, like we said before. Pursuing greatness 
truth and beauty. Sounds a lot like what the goal of our humanities classes are, right? Greatness, truth, and beauty. So, those are the key goals. But who is this poet? Because you can't just have a movement without the people starting it. So what should these poets actually be doing? Well, he says that the poet should be a wise, sensitive, spirited, thoughtful communicator. All right. These poets, as you'll see, are sort of uplifting themselves as the ultimate dudes uh, to be that they're, that they're able to distill the world better than anyone else can, which is fine. And he says, though, this is the goal. We all fall short. So he does recognize that. He's like, look, I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to try to present the world in as, as creative a way as I possibly can. I'm going to show you spirit. I'm going to show you your soul. But ultimately, it's you. And you have to go out and live your own life because even me writing about it in as best way I can still won't be, it'll pale in comparison to you actually experiencing what life has to offer. He also says that the poet seeks ultimate truth, aims for human connection, not occupational. In other words, he's not trying to appeal to you as someone of a certain class. He doesn't care what job you have. He doesn't care how much money you have or what your education is. He wants to reach you. He cares about you individually as the reader. The poet embraces different forms of knowledge. As you see in his piece, he talks a lot about not, uh, not avoiding science. He believes science and art can coexist, that they actually inform each other. And instead of dividing ourselves into these camps of, oh, I only believe in science, oh, I only want to live this artistic, creative, imaginative life. No, you should actually be working together because we all learn from each other. And the poet does that, and he embraces that. Here's something that uh, Whitman will come back to later on as well. The poet has elevated thoughts, but those thoughts are present in all people. So even though the poet is presenting himself as someone who has this insight into human nature or actual nature, he says, you all have it. Yeah, the poet is the one using it a little more often right now, but he wants all of us to use it as well. These poets are not special, as Whitman distinctly says here in a second. And again, he's writing for everyone, not just elites or other poets. Not exactly true, because Wordsworth and Coleridge competed with each other, and they showed each other their work all the time, and so they are trying to impress each other. But the goal of these authors is to write for all people. All right. One of the ways that uh, we can see Wordsworth's real goal of how he presents his ideas in an actual poem is in the piece called uh, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. I know, I know you can't see it, but I couldn't resist it because I got it moving. I was so happy when I found that. Let me, uh, let me read this quick poem to you, and then we'll, we'll go through it. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not be but gay in such a jocund company. means cheerful. I dazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft when on my couch I lie in vacant or pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Brilliant little poem that really encapsulates what he says as he gets towards the uh, end of his preface. The idea that emotions collected in tranquility. That's what he's trying to convey here, I think. Emotions collected, rec recollected in tranquility. Meaning, he wants us to experience the beauty of everyday life. Wake up. Pay attention. Get out there. See stuff. Be a part of things. That's what life is all about, actually. While you're doing those things, be aware of how you feel, how those things react with you. 
Don't just ignore it. Pay attention to it. Then when you're done experiencing those things, sit quietly, peacefully, and let your mind think back to how you felt when you experienced those things. Let yourself be at peace and actually think. And then, as a poet, write them down. Write down those feelings. That's what happens in Daffodils. It's about a guy wandering through a field. He sees this beautiful golden display of these flowers dancing in the breeze. And later on, he's able to sit quietly on his couch and remember what he saw and explain how beautiful that scene was. That's what poetry is. Emotions recollected, recollected in tranquility. I can be peaceful and I can think back to the emotions and I can have them again. I think ultimately what Wordsworth is trying to do here is he's, he's essentially saying, these are my words, not his, I'm not replacing your previous love of poetry, but I am offering a new type of love along with a new type of poetry. So he's not saying the old ways are terrible and we should get rid of them and never read Shakespeare again or anything like that. He's just saying, here's something new. I want you to think about it. You're going to have to like it in a different way because it's very different than the poems from before. So you're going to have to change your, your vision of what poetry should be. But give it a try. And ultimately, it's up to you if you think I've accomplished what I've set out to do. You can feel free to judge me if you want. So that's what Wordsworth, uh, that's a quick summary of his lyrical, uh, preface to his lyrical ballads. So his lyrical ballads was a book of poetry, and this is an essay that appeared at the beginning of it sort of his rationale for why he's doing what he's doing. All right, so that's Wordsworth. So that's the British beginning of Romanticism. But there's also an American side to this, and that's where Walt Whitman comes in. Whitman is a couple decades later, but he's going to say many of the same things, and it might be useful for you to think about in preparation for a potential test question. How exactly are the British and American versions of Romanticism the same, and what do they cover that might be different? We're going to share a few of those right now. So when we think about these poets, to set up who this guy Whitman is, over on the left there is Wordsworth, who we just read. In the middle is John Keats, who um, was a very young and excellent British poet during this time. And then an American poet, uh, Longfellow, who was the most famous American poet uh, of the time, the early uh, 1800s. Notice how their paintings are depicted. Okay, Shoulders up, very classical poses. They look very distinguished and smart and elite. And now we'll see what the image of Whitman is in his book, Leaves of Grass, where our, um, our preface comes from today. This is how Whitman presents himself. right. It's cool, right? Yeah. He's not a stuffy guy in this fancy clothing sitting and posing for a painting. He's a guy who shows almost his full body. It goes down to his knees. He's wearing casual clothes. Looks like he could be a guy who works in town. He could be a guy who works in the fields. It's hard to tell. He's got a hat on, kind of cocked to the side, looking, looking smooth. All right. He's casual. He's got his hand on his hip. He's a regular guy. The coolest thing about this is his book that he self-publishes, Leaves of Grass, he prints the first copy, uh, the first several hundred copies himself, because no one cared about it, no one wanted to buy it, so he did it himself. He published the plain cover. Inside the cover is just this picture. No name. I was like, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. Here's, here's a book, and here's me. Read it. Like, that's what he, he doesn't even say who he is. He mentions his own name later on in the, in the poems, but his name isn't on the cover. This is who we're dealing with, okay? So, Walt Whitman is already setting him up in the publication of his first major book as someone who is going to do things differently. All right, we'll see how exactly. So Whitman's work is mostly inspired by his buddy, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was a very important person during this time period, you should really read some of his, uh, his works. And uh, Emerson wrote this essay called The Poet. And in it, he says a couple things that are going to carry through the main ideas of Whitman's essay. 
He says, America is a poem in our eyes. Its ample geography dazzles the imagination, and it will not wait long for meters, meaning lines of, lines of writing. America itself is a poem. Wordsworth's going to say the exact thing here in a minute. Regarding style, for it is not meters, the, the rhythm of a poem, but a meter-making argument that makes a poem, a thought so passionate and alive that like the spirit of a plant or an animal, it has an architecture of its own and adorns nature with a new thing. Again, let's do something new, right? Let's change our ways. A poet is at his best when he speaks somewhat wildly, not with the intellect. Again, almost kind of like what Socrates said, but also the idea of overflow of emotion from Wordsworth. All right? Sorry, I forgot to hit the button. So these are some of the key ideas that Wordsworth, or sorry, Whitman takes from Emerson's essay and extrapolates them out into his own kind of manifesto, his philosophy of American literature. So we'll start with the first point. This is number one. So what is America's relationship to poetry? Well, we've got to remember that American literature, American literature, doesn't really exist for the most part. I mean, it exists in that there's American writers, but we don't have a distinct style. Most of our writing at this time, even all the way into the 1850s, is still kind of British sounding. It looks a lot like British writing. Most of the people who came here were from Western Europe, so we've really just been picking up the traditions that have been left to us. There's nothing really American about it. Well, Whitman comes along here. He's uh, obviously he's born closer to the beginning of the century, but by the time he's writing these works, we're about 60, 70, 80 years into our, our nationhood. And he's saying, look, we're now a real country. We need to have a literature that actually looks like America. So what's that going to be? And Whitman says, I'm just the guy to, <laughs> just the guy to do it. Well, so let's see what it says. Well, he's prepared to actually make that definition, and he's the one who's going to define it. Give it a new voice. Let me switch over to Whitman for a second. One of my favorite things that Whitman says at the beginning of his essay, first of all, is that the first word of the essay is the word America. He starts it with that word. There's no mistake from the beginning of this essay, this is what this piece will be about. He says, we are worthy of great literature. We are not elites. We are strong in soul, not just appearance. So when he says towards the, the beginning of the piece, second paragraph, the Americans of all nations at any time upon the earth have probably the fullest poetical nature. It's a pretty bold statement. He's saying, I don't care how long you, you other countries have been around, centuries, millennia. Uh, we're brand new. We're the most poetic country. Why? The United States themselves are essentially the greatest poem meaning the way we are constructed makes us like a poem. Here is not merely a nation, but a teeming nation of nations. Sounds a lot like some of our factions we talked about before. Here are the roughs and beards and space and ruggedness and nonchalance that the soul loves. America is a different place. The genius of the United States is not best or most in its executives or legislators. One of my favorite lines of all time. We are not our politicians, okay? And in fact, as he says later in the paragraph, the thing that makes America great is we don't bow down to kings. The president takes his hat off to us, not us to him. Love it. So because we're a different country, we have the largeness of nature, of, uh, of nature, we need a corresponding largeness and generosity of the spirit of the citizen. So we are a big, beautiful, great country. We need citizens who are also excellent and great and strong and smart. And we need our arts to reflect both of those. So if that's the connection to America, what should an American poet be? Well, he should be, see how this echoes Wordsworth a bit, commensurate with a people. He needs to be a regular person, not an elite. He's just like all of us. 
He needs to be transcendent and new. So while he's like all of us, he also needs to aim to go beyond all of us. He needs to be able to um, have the vision to be able to explain and, and write about these things that are done in a new way. The, po <laughs> the poet is the common referee, the equalizer of his age and land, the ultimate brain. Someone who can influence and inspire other people. So again, kind of playing both sides. I'm going to be a regular guy, but I'm also going to do these amazing things. It's a bit of both, all right? Lastly, a seer, an individual, complete in himself. I don't need other things or people to validate me. I am who I am. If you don't like it, fine, but I'm going to do the best I can, and I'm going to live the best life I can. I'm my own person. Love it. All right, so what should a poet do then? If that's who he's supposed to be, what should he do? Well, the poet should have really big ideas. Big ideas. As he says, the greatest poet hardly knows pettiness or triviality. You should aim for the highest levels of what humanity has to offer. An American poet shouldn't rely on previous forms and styles. Again, similar to Wordsworth. I'm not going to write like the people of old. I'm not going to write like people from other countries. I'm going to do it differently. The poet loves nature. He goes on for quite a bit about nature. But you can see why it's worthwhile, because America, I haven't traveled around the world, but I would argue America probably has... It has a bit of everything. That's what makes it awesome. In one country, we've got rocky cliffs and beautiful beaches. We've got deserts. We've got swamps. We've got amazingly beautiful mountains. We've got fertile soil. We've got brutally cold places and ridiculously hot places. We've got lakes and glorious rivers. We've got canyons. We've got everything all in one place. Hardly any other place in the world can say that. That's amazing. That's how diverse we are, and that's how beautiful our land is that we call home. And so poets should write about that stuff. The poet should also live a life of poetry, meaning being open to experience and seeking the truth. Being a poet doesn't mean being a writer for these guys. Being a poet means being a human being. You live poetry. We'll talk more about that here in a moment. Our goal is to make readers see things differently. I'm not just going to explain things the way, you know, the way anyone else would. I'm going to make you appreciate a sunset or a mountain or a friendship or whatever it is. I'm going to make you appreciate it in a slightly different way than you've ever been told before. And lastly, I'm going to inspire you to show you that you can be a poet too. Yeah, I'm the one doing the writing, but you all can be poets. You all have it within you to do exactly what I'm doing. I'm just the only one who's doing it, <laughs> all right? So a couple other key ideas. Poetry as heroism. All right, this is where he says, uh, a heroic person walks at his ease through and out of that custom or precedent or authority that suits him not. A hero is someone says, yeah, I don't like the way the old things, how, how people did it the old way. I'm gonna do something different. That's called being a hero. I can walk away from it and be confident in myself that I can, I can handle what, whatever comes up. Poetry uni uh, unifies all of us as humans. He says, come to us on equal terms. We are no better than you. What we enclose, you enclose. What we enjoy, you may enjoy. Yeah, I'm the one writing, but I'm not better than you. You're just as good. We're, we're equally as valuable. Let's share this experience of reading and writing together. Similar to Wordsworth, poetry can fit with science. He says, exact science and its practical movements are no checks on the greatest poet, but always his encouragement and his support. We can, we can coexist. I don't, need, I don't need to know about the angle of the Earth's axis and where, you know, what our elliptical revolution around the sun is for me to appreciate a sunset. <laughs> I can go out and look at it and think it's beautiful and that God made it and it's amazing. Yeah, the science helps, I get it, but I don't have to have it. We can appreciate beauty, we can appreciate physics and science and math and all those things. They don't, they don't hinder each other, they're both great. It's rooted in 
liberty. Poets are the voice and exposition of liberty. The attitude of great poets is to cheer up slaves, horrify despots. We believe in equal friendship and calling no man master. Or, uh, Whitman was a strong advocate against slavery. He, he's someone who believes we're all equal, we're all the same, and his poetry completely demonstrates that. We're all meant to be free individuals. Poetry is natural, real, and simple. Uh, yeah, simple, which is interesting because it, it contrasts pretty nicely. Like he, he's, he has a hint of what could come, and that's called modernism. Next semester, you'll see that. Um, but it doesn't have to be uh, distorted. He says, uh, that which distorts honest shapes or which creates unearthly beings or places or contingencies is a nuisance and revolt of the human form especially is so great it must never be made ridiculous. Most works are most beautiful without ornament. But they don't need, the world doesn't need to be fancied up. It's amazing. It's beautiful as it is. My job as the poet is just to get you to realize that. Other authors who try to do extravagant things, they're actually ruining it. If they try to distort it to prove some point, they're making everything worse. Just take, take it as it is. It's already, it's already beautiful. And lastly, poetry is actually more honest than history, he says. The, the old cliche that, well, historians are written by the winners, right? So how can we trust what we read in history books if all uh, that we've, uh, that's written is written by the people who ended up winning? What about the other side? What about the full, uh, the full story? Poetry actually explains things better than history, he says. All right. So lastly, what is he ultimately saying here? Well, the poetry is for everyone and a place for recognizing and exploring our shared humanity. Notice he says, a great poem is for ages and ages in common and for all degrees and in complexions and all departments and sects and for a woman as much as a man and a man as much as a woman. A great poem is no finish to a man or a woman, but rather a beginning. He also blends that with the idea that it can actually transcend traditional religions. Whitman is a bit of a deist. He believes in a God, but he believes in many possible gods. He doesn't He's not a Christian at all. He, I would consider him very much a, a humanist as well. Um, and that's where you know, his idea that we're all the same, we're all together, we're all part of nature. Um, he doesn't look at it the way we would, that we're created necessarily in the image of God. He just views it in a, in a, a natural and humanistic way. And lastly, our English is the best because it's a composite of varied forms. I love this quick paragraph. The English language befriends the grand American expression, is brawny enough and limber and full enough on the tough stock of a race who through all change and circumstance was never without the idea of political liberty, which is the animus of all liberty, which has attracted the terms of daintier and gayer and subtler and more elegant tongues. Meaning we've got, we got rough and tough people, we've got people who are high-minded and intelligent and think about complex things, and we all come together in the same place. It is the powerful language of resistance. It is the dialect of common sense. It is the speech of the proud and melancholy races and of all who aspire. It is the chosen tongue to express growth, faith, self-esteem, freedom, justice, equality, friendliness, amplitude, prudence, decision, and courage. Without commas between any of those, meaning all of those ideas all at once. They're all within us all the time. It's the medium that shall well nigh express the inexpressible. That's what English does. It's the language of John Locke and Thomas Jefferson, and it's about to be Abraham Lincoln here in a couple years, all of who, whom proclaimed ideas that founded our, our, our fundamental ideas of what a nation should be. And they all did it in English. It's our language. Our language did all those amazing things. That's why Whitman is so passionate. Just a few minutes left. Let's look at uh, the very beginning, to finish up, of his most famous poem. Well, before, to wrap up his preface, 
Can we achieve these lofty goals? Well, again, that's up for the reader to decide. Can an individual define a nation? Can we view Whitman or any of you as the ultimate American? Can you be a representation of this country? And conversely, can a nation define you? Can we tell that you're an American? Big goals. So, Song of Myself, we're going to look at the, the, first, the first tiny section, just to get a bit of a flavor for who, who Whitman is, and is, is he actually employing all the things that we just talked about? So this is, a, this is right after your preface in your, uh, um, the PDF that we uploaded for you. All right. Let me get to my copy here. So first line, I celebrate myself and sing myself in that incredible first word, I, I, just like the first word of his preface is America. I don't think it's a coincidence that he's also using the first word of I here, that this is the thing I want you to focus on. You might think, well, wow, what, a, what an ego this guy has. He's going to write a gigantic poem just about himself. Maybe, we'll, we'll have to find out, but he says, I celebrate and sing myself. I have within me all of the qualities that are worth singing about, that are worth celebrating. My humanness has it inherent with it. But it's not just about him. Because what he says, and what I assume, you shall assume. So it's not just about me. Yeah, I'm going to talk about me for a few minutes. But you should also be thinking about that I is actually you. You should apply this I to yourself. The word assume is kind of an interesting word because it assume sort of has a couple different meanings. It means to, to take on something, but it also means to uh, uh, have, a, have a thought that could belong to someone else too. So uh, the word assume could, could go a couple different ways here. But he's making this transition right from the get-go that, yeah, it's going to be about me, but it's also about you. Women writes a lot about the body. If you read the rest of his poems, he's always talking about what makes up the physical human body. For every atom belonging to me, as good belongs to you. Again, we're all equal. None of us are more valuable or more special than anyone else. We're all humans. We're all here. Whatever I'm going through, you're going through too, and vice versa. We're all in this together. And I love this line, I loaf and invite my soul. Something I don't think we do enough of. The word loaf nowadays has a connotation of laziness, but back then the word loaf simply meant to relax. It meant to rest, to take a break. So he's saying, kind of like uh, Wordsworth did, I'm going to take time to just sit quietly, and I'm going to think and I'm going to just let my soul, I'm going to welcome my soul to experience whatever goes on around me. And I'm going to be okay with it. I'm not in a rush. I don't need distractions. I'm going to just sit here and invite my soul to take in whatever it needs to take in. I lean. I'm going to, I'm going to recline. I'm going to lay down and relax. And loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. Again, these folks want to embrace nature. That's where you can be in touch with yourself and what, for us anyway, what God has created for you. I'm going to be part of nature, and nature is what's going to give my soul something to react to. I'm going to observe. I'm going to watch and pay attention. Again, back to elements of his body. My tongue, which we know tongue means, yeah, it's part of your body, but it's also your voice. It's your speech. It's the words you use. My tongue, every atom of my blood formed from this soil, this air, born here of parents, born here from parents the same, and their parents the same. So again, we're developing an American sensibility of what an artistic literary philosophy might be. He's not a newcomer like previous generations were. He's not just coming over from England uh, like the colonists did or from other parts of Western Europe. He's been here a while. His folks were here. His grandparents were here. He is an American. All right? He is part of this soil. So everything that America is is also part of him. 
I now 37 years old in perfect health begin. 37. Now, Whitman actually lived to be a pretty decent age, but a lot of people didn't back then. So 37, to start your life over and have this new philosophy of life is it's a bit, of a, it's a bit, it's a bit old for, for this time period. But it's also, I think, instructive for us because we think, you know, we live in this hustle and bustle world. We think, oh, I've got every, everything figured out when I'm 22 and I've got to, you know, be on my career and be started with life and have a family and all these things have to be figured out and I have to buy a big house by the time I'm 24. And Oh, my goodness. Women says, no, no, no. I'm 37. I've already lived a full life, right? He, wor he, he stopped going to school at age 11 and started working at a newspaper, okay? He's already lived a long life. He was a journalist. He uh, is going to eventually uh, volunteer as a medical worker in the Civil War. He's, he's living a full life already, but he's also open enough to realize, I don't have everything figured out. I'm ready to be, I'm ready to change a bit. I'm ready to try something different. So what's he going to begin? Hoping to cease, not till death. Hopefully my new philosophy can carry me forward. Creeds and schools in abeyance. So creeds are beliefs, schools, ways of thinking. Yeah, we all have traditions. We've all been brought up. We all have churches and professors and parents and all these people telling us how we should live and that's all fine as he says they're going to retire a while sufficed at what they are but never forgotten I'm not going to forget those but I'm not going to focus on them right now I'm just going to sit and listen to what the world has to tell me I harbor for good or bad whatever happens in the world I'm open to it I'm not just only looking for positive things. I know that there's bad things in the world, and I'm okay with that. I permit to speak at every hazard. I'm going to talk about anything I want. No one's going to tell me what to say or do anymore. Nature without check with original energy. Again, back to Wordsworth. Life is meant to be lived, to have energy, to have excitement and passion. Yeah, sometimes we need to be quiet and contemplate and reflect. But also once we've done that, we need to have a reaction to that. We need to be able to participate in our own lives, not just watch it go by. You know, I was, I was on vacation, just as many of you were the last few days. I was down in Mexico, I was, uh, over Thanksgiving, I went to the beach and I was with my wife and a couple friends of ours and their friends, uh, our friends had kids that were about your age, <coughs> college age, early 20s. And every morning my wife and I are out walking on the beach and we're doing stuff outside. It's no, not a cloud in the sky. It's 75 degrees. It's perfect, beautiful every single day. And our friend's kids were in the condo, on the couch, with their phones for four days. And I thought, oh my goodness, Whitman and Wordsworth would be rolling in their graves if they saw what was happening. You've got to go live life. You've got to be a part of it. The world doesn't happen on your computer screen. Having, having a text conversation isn't life. You've got to be a part of it. God has given us this God has given us this beautiful creation to enjoy. Everything is amazing. How do we not know that? People are amazing. They're incredibly complex. Friendships, love interests, teachers, coaches. Neighbors, people are incredible. Nature is incredible. All the opportunities you've been given in your life, incredible, mind-blowing. And yet, do we pay attention to all of them? I'm always amazed when I hear young people talk about, ah, oh, things are so boring. I don't like that class. I don't like that book. I don't like that whatever. It's boring. Little secret. It's not the world that's boring. You're the one. You're the boring one. Because the world is amazing. So, I thought that'd get a rise idea. God has given us tremendous gifts. Are you actually paying attention to them? That's what Whitman and Wordsworth are trying to get at, I think. Po a quick quote from a female author named George Sand. That was her uh, alias. He who draws noble delights from sentiment of poetry is a true poet. 
though he has never written a line in all his life. You don't have to be a writer. You don't have to be a painter or a musician or any of those creative things to, be, to live like a poet. Whitman and Wordsworth are asking, and all the romantics, are asking you to live a life of poetry, not just read their poetry. If you want to read it, great. But even more than that, you should live it out. Love nature. Love each other. Love big ideas. Be interested in trying a whole bunch of stuff. That's what it means to live like a poet.